Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Anybody else who wandered in? This is the College of Complexes. And tonight we will be dealing with ancient Italians. Uh, Eugene Crowley Jr. here uh, is the author of Upside Down World, The Loss of the Sacred Cosmos, and he will be telling us something about how the ancient aliens would have influenced the uh, humankind. Thank you very much. It's an honor to return to the College of Complex. And I hope everyone had a very good Thanksgiving holiday. And I hope you will enjoy the presentation tonight. Yeah, I made out an outline, and I, as I really like to talk off the top of my head, but I probably will have to refer to the outline because there's so much to cover. And even last night, I learned a lot about what we call ancient aliens and their spacecraft and so forth. I did give you some handouts, and it's for you to verify the information that I'm giving you. And if you want to, on your own, you can go to the internet, see for yourself, and perhaps you'll be interested to learn more about what I'm saying. I would try to, to do this, I guess, from my own experience. And I remember in 19, in the early 70s, some of my students told me about Eric Donegan, Von Donegan's book, The Chariot of the Gods. And as a teacher, I did not want to discourage my students, but I did not dismiss the book, nor did I encourage it, but I just told them that I had to read it before I could make some evaluation from the book. And this is what I like to do on something or anything that I am not familiar with. I do not like to condemn something that I don't know anything about. And to be very honest, I had not heard further from Mr. Von Denken, uh, let's say from the 70s until probably uh, the last year or so when I ventured out and with the cable TV, and it seems like every week there are many series from the ancient aliens, and he is nearly on all of them. And it's surprising because I believe the last couple of years, you can go to the website, history.com website, and you can order the DVDs, you can look at the past presentations concerning ancient aliens. Before I go further uh, into Mr. Von Dinkins' work, Danny's work, I do um, want to say that the person that has taught me the most was Zachariah Sitchin, and the many terms at the very end in the glossary, these are from this book, The Lost Book of Inky Memoirs and Prophecies of an Extraterrestrial God. Mr. Sitchin was able to interpret ancient Sumerian writing. And if we read his work, we will find most of the events in Genesis, the book of Genesis from the Bible, in the works of Mr. Sitchin. I have maybe a half dozen books by him, and they are very interesting. And he tells uh, visitors from other planets, or one planet, that came to Earth. These were called the Anunnaki. You'll find the term on the glossary. Some people call them Nephilim. Some people call them Elohim. But these were people who came down, and they were so intelligent that they jump-started our civilization. And every so often, according to Sitchin and other writers, they do return to the earth. I tend to, I don't know, I don't want to say believe, I don't want to say I disbelieve, but I like to reread his books 
because they do say many things that other people are, are saying. And as I said before, they're very interesting. They have artwork. He explains the artwork. And he has written so many books that I believe NASA has uh, more or less confirmed his writings. I believe Mr. Sitchin passed away maybe in October of 2010. I believe his daughter is in charge of his website. If you get a chance to go to his website, I would recommend that because it's very, very interesting. And you'll be surprised or amazed at some of the things that he did write. Another person that I was familiar with and this is David Childress. He wrote several books about lost cities. And he's on um, many of these, if not every one of these, ancient alien programs. And I just reread this afternoon that he wrote that King Solomon had a, a car that ran through space. And many of the uh, writers make a point that the ancient people didn't have a word for rockets, spaceships, or aircraft. So they call them by such names as fiery chariots, maybe uh, flying carpets. The Chinese perhaps used the term dragons that gave out smoke and fire. And Apollo had a fiery chariot. The Hindus, the term they use is vamanas, wing discs. Okay, but it's amazing that we believe our society right now is the most advanced technological society that has ever been, but many people who are on the program of these ancient aliens say that we are rediscovering these forms of transportation and technology. They refer to weapons that the gods supposedly use, lightning bolts and uh, Poseidon's trident. And many people, many of these writers believe that these were advanced weapons. And you have to read several accounts of mythology because they do tell, according to the writers or the uh, authors of many books on ancient alien theories, they believe that the people who wrote these down, these tales down, were reporting what they saw. They did not make up these stories as mainstream society feels that mythology is something that's made up, it's fantasy, it's far-fetched, but many speakers on these programs are stating that these things actually happened. And the people were called gods, but they were not gods in the sense they created the world, but they had supernatural strength, supernatural um, intelligence. And if you look on the, um, the page with Graham Hancock's name at the very bottom, you'll see some of the feats that they could do. They could disappear at will, they could turn from humans to animals, from males to females, and they were just quite different. If you want to check this out again, Zeph's happy the first time, and this is supposedly documented in ancient Egypt that these people from a different world actually came to Egypt and just started their civilization. So, our society, especially historians and people in colleges, they will dismiss this without even considering what people have said. And I somewhat feel like this is a very unfair way to uh, judge or to evaluate something. It's very, very difficult to discuss something or to judge something without having knowledge. Many of us can prejudge something in a second, but do we do justice to ourselves and to the topic that we are trying to uh, evaluate? So, 
as I said before, if things are given to me or ideas are given to me I don't know anything about, I feel like I do not have to answer right away or especially denounce something when I don't even know what I'm denouncing. So I take the approach that if I can find something uh, more about what I'm trying to evaluate, then I feel free to make my statement. So with, I believe it was in, okay, maybe around 1990, I read David Children's books. He wrote several books on lost cities, lost cities in the Mediterranean area, lost cities in Mesoamerican area, and practically every um, part of the world. And these people traveled, and they explored. And Graham Hancock is another person who goes through these ancient sites, and they study, and they more or less discount what mainstream society says. And to me, as I said earlier, mainstream society really doesn't look into this because they feel like, you know, this is the way the West culture is, is the best culture that ever was, is the best culture that will ever be, and yet we do not have the wisdom that these ancient societies had. We do not know exactly why such monuments as Stonehenge and uh, other monuments do exist. These programs do mention sites that were built some 2,000 years ago, and these sites are in strange places such as caves, and if you go into these caves, it's almost like going to, uh, let's say, a museum such as the Field Museum or even the Culture Center downtown, where the artwork is just so fantastic that you wonder how in the world could primitive people build these things with such beauty and symmetry, and it, it's astounding how outstanding that the work and the artwork especially. So again, it's always wise to be informed about what you are trying to discuss. Anyone could say, well, I don't believe that, but again, have experience. Check into something before you discount something because like I said before, talk is cheap, and anyone can condemn something, but you'll be surprised that you may find that these things were meant to tell us something, and many of the writers on the program state that these people came here to tell us various lessons. I saw a program tonight, and it was on the Gothic cathedrals, and these cathedrals are so outstanding and beautiful. They have a lot of carved figures on the building. And supposedly, they tell a story. And these were built all over Europe. Many Gothic temples and sites like Stonehenge and the pyramids were built on ley lines. And ley lines are according to the History Channel. It's like a world grid that various vortexes of energy are located at these places. And if you go to these places, such as the Pyramid or Stonehenge, you may have an altered consciousness. And these were meant to help people in the sense that at certain times of the year, the sun comes through certain parts of these structures, and they're related to the stars and so forth, but they're very, very dynamic because they were built with stones that perhaps were 50 tons each, and people cannot imagine how they were moved, and many of the programs, or at least one program stated that acoustics may have moved these stones into place, and there are so many, let's say, forms of, I uh, imagine, physics that can prove that these things can happen. On one program, there was a man in Florida who built his 
house with stones and a garden with stones, and he said that he knew the tricks of the stones. So there's something about these ancient monuments and stonework that the people in the past knew how to work with these things. And most programs still state that we hardly, or we cannot construct a pyramid, we cannot uh, move stones as if they were like weightless, but for some reason these people knew how to move these stones. So, with my knowledge, <coughs> let's say when I rewrote the book, I had to rewrite the book because I wrote the book as if I were writing it for a college class and I used third person senior pronoun and I had to make it more personal. And when I did rewrite the book, I found out more about ancient aliens. And to me, it's very interesting because we can find these mentionings in the Bible. In the last couple of days, or let's say a couple of weeks, I found out that the well, I'm pretty sure all of you are familiar with Jonah in the well, where he was on the ship and he somehow fell off the boat. According to, uh, well, no matter what happened, he was in the water and he was swallowed by a so-called whale or fish, but I just learned that the whale had ribs of brass, according to the ancient alien theories. So, and this is another new term that I've learned. It's called USO, yeah. Unidentified Submerged Objects. And um, this is, again, the last couple of months. I like learning new things, and other people have stated or witnessed that these objects came from the water or they went down into the water, and there's just so much that, let's say, mainstream society will let us know, but if you watch programs like these, and read books by Hatcher, not, I'm sorry, uh, Childress, you can find, or at least uh, stimulate your imagination to want to read more. So, the Bible, I believe, does mention several uh, incidences that UFOs or ancient aliens came to us. And I guess the first one that I can recall is Elijah uh, being taken away in the fiery chariot. And as I said before, a fiery, fiery chariot is a name that people from the past used to indicate that there were um, spacecrafts that these people used. I believe a couple of days ago on one of the uh, programs they mentioned that Jesus perhaps could have been taken on a spacecraft. So, when you ascend into heaven, it's, it's so, this is what I believe, you don't just rise, but there has to be some type of a vehicle to take a person up there. So, again, it's, it's just something, we can read something and not really know what we're reading, but if we perhaps see something that has news light on what we've been reading all along, we may feel like, well, maybe this is true of what they're saying. They also mentioned in the Bible Ezekiel's vision of the wheel within the wheel, and most people believe that this was a description of a UFO. Okay. Many of the books, or many of the programs mentioned Baalbek, and this was a place in northern Lebanon, and according to the ancient alien theories that Gilgamesh, the Sumerian hero, <laughs> went to this landing area. And it supposedly was one of the first in the ancient world. And again, this was constructed with stones weighing 
thousands and thousands and thousands of pounds. And again, how could people, how could ancient people lift these things without certain knowledge that perhaps we still don't know how these particular uh, stones were moved? I believe in, maybe it was around 96, 1996, I started watching a program called Stargate SG-1, and it was a science fiction, what we call science fiction. And of course, I shouldn't say of course, I'm sorry. It involved a team from, from the military who went to different worlds, and they would go through a Stargate, a portal, uh, some people may call it a wormhole, and many of these programs centered on ancient aliens mentioned that there may be or may have been wormholes here on Earth that people went through and carried them to a different galaxy. And so I was surprised that when I looked in, pardon me, one of my favorite books. It's a journal of African civilization, and I did find a character named Apophis, and Apophis was a character on the Stargate series, and Apophis was the ruler of Upper Egypt, no, Lower Egypt. Lower Egypt is closer to the Mediterranean, whereas Upper Egypt is south of Lower Egypt. Okay, <laughs> up is down and down is up. <laughs> but anyway, I've always been fascinated with history and I believe a lot of people are still interested in these ancient aliens and the more you read, the more uh, perhaps you can become acquainted with things. Another person from the Bible, Enoch. Enoch was supposedly... Um, he lived 365 years and it was carried off in spacecraft. And Enoch supposedly was Hermes Trismegistus. And this person, in, in my research, he was carried off into the heavens and when he came back, he brought back all of the measurements like the measurements that we use to measure things, the foot, the yard, so, ha so, so have you. And I read that he also began all of the arts and sciences that we studied in college. And I also read that he was another incarnation of Jesus. So here we have this one person who not only gave us all of the scholastic subjects, that we study, but also the basis of religion, especially for, I guess, all major religions, because he says the same thing that the perennial philosophy has stated, that there is a divine substance to everything that exists on the world, and if we know this, we will honor and respect everything on the earth, and when we do this, we do grow in morality and wisdom. So again, be aware of the fact that the Bible has been edited and there have been books that have been left out and it's just wise to have knowledge of this and to know that there are many interpretations that people give for the same thing. And the Bible and most sacred books were written by people from a different hemisphere, especially the mind. Their minds were open, whereas the Western society only uses a small portion of the mind from the, West, the left side, which is very intellectual, very rational. And I really feel that you really cannot, you really have to keep a balance between the mind, body, and spirit. And we tend to say, well, I can't see the spirit, so I can't judge it, so therefore it doesn't exist. But many of us have had, perhaps, things that happen to us that we don't actually know, but yet we have a feeling within our gut that we are doing the right thing. So we are, perhaps, our best reference to 
judge for ourselves what we want to do and so forth. So basically, we have several people to refer to if you think of ancient aliens. And again, we can look at the Bible. We can look at the Egyptian idea of Zep Tepi. And I like the web page, the Crystal Link, because it's very, very complicated. And it talks about Osiris and Osiris and his religion, supposedly is the world's oldest religion. And before people wanted to be like celebrities, they wanted to be like the Pharaoh, Osar, or Osiris. And this is part of the divine plan that the ancient Egyptians followed. And they followed divine laws. They connected themselves to the community, to nature, and to the universe, and to the mind that created the universe. These people were seen as the first sociologists, the first ecologists, and they just lived true. They lived true in every area of their life. And as they lived true, they grew in morality and wisdom. There are people today from the Eastern philosophy that says that we need to use more wisdom that we should adopt a new paradigm instead of the survival of the fittest, we should adopt a new paradigm, the survival of the wisest. It is something that the more violence we use, we tend to not follow the rules or the submission to God. I feel that our nation, as a secular nation, it transcends or it rises above the laws that keep harmony with man, God, and the universe. And we are very much, or at least the media and those who are high up in our society would not listen to people who would like to correct them and like to show them the right way to move, to live. And because of this, there are consequences when we disobey the laws that the ancient people used. A nation is somewhat inferior to a civilization. The civilization cultivated their light side or their souls. It seems as if nations tend to cultivate the dark side. They like to destroy light. They like to uh, not open up their conscience, which tells them to do not do certain things. One of the writers that I was familiar with when I rewrote the book was Osho. And Osho says, we need to open up our hearts. And we cannot open up our hearts until our conscience comes in activation. We have to relax our emotions. Most people in our society, if something is done to them, they tend to retaliate instead of soothing or ignoring their emotions, they feel they must work out their, their bad emotions by retaliating on those who did harm to them. But the ancient races, especially the Egyptians, they mummified their emotions. If, you can if we can control our emotions, we can go and open up different areas of our energy system, such as the chakra system, and this will perhaps make us to become more enlightened. Also compared the uh, chakra system with the snake metaphorically lying at the base of our spine. And if we can relax our energy system, this snake will straighten up and will make a path through the spine and make the circular or semicircular path in our brain and then we become enlightened or awake. I think that many of you have seen photographs, or not so much photographs, 
Let's say illustrations of Jesus with the shepherd's crook. Yeah. As you know, Jesus was not a shepherd, but that crook tells that he is an ascended master. That crook shows the same path that the Kundalini has made from the base of the spring, spine up through the head. The same with Tahuti, who is the Egyptian god of wisdom. He's pictured as as a man with an ibis head. An ibis is a bird with a beak that is curved. And it is the same message that Jesus gives with his shepherd's crook. I haven't mentioned the Mayans, but many of you are probably aware of the fact that the Mayans uh, devised three different calendars, and the one calendar, the long count, supposedly ends at what, 2012, and many people are somewhat, how do you say, afraid or uptight, thinking that the world is going to end at 2012. But many people feel like we are going into a new age, a new cycle, and this cycle should be more peaceful. Many people say that we are living the last few years of the Iron Age, and the Iron Age is characterized by people being violent, that arrogance is equated with scholarship, that wealth is indicative of class, and for the ancient world, class was determined by one's ethics, one's morals, one's uh, being respectful to one another. So, some people do feel that parts of the world will vanish, but the entire world supposedly will not end. We're going in to a new cycle, and many people believe that this cycle will be the age of Aquarius, which was predicted probably in the 60s. But even in the 60s, there was a man named Rene Schwaller in the 30s who studied um, ancient Egyptian culture and civilization and so forth, and he was a person who used the term intelligence of the heart. He stated that the Egyptians had a different consciousness where they lived from the inside, meaning their minds told them how to intuit, their minds told them how to act, their minds told them that everything was connected to one another. So therefore, participate in the world instead of trying to subjugate the world. And Rene Schwaller predicted an age of Aquarius, and he predicted that there would be an elite, and he used the term elite in the sense that people's values, people's morals would be so fine that they would influence other people to do the same. Edward Casey is another person that let's say alternate historians refer to Edgar Casey oh, yeah. spoke of the four races of men and he saw Jesus as a part of the second, I believe the second race of men and he also saw Jesus having many incarnations. But the thing about Edgar Casey, when he was a kid, he read the Bible over and over and over again and according to his writings, an angel came to him and asked him what did he want and of course I guess he was granted this special vision to see in the future or in the past. But my point is, reading to me is, is, is very special, it's very magical. And I like to reread books and I like to read vicariously and I feel I can learn many things by reading. But Again, many people do not believe certain things that our media says, and I think many people are unhappy with the media because the media is just somewhat slanted, and it really endorses people, or let's say their own way of looking at the world, the way that the West sees itself as being superior above everybody, and most everybody else is inferior. So it's like you have to read between the lines when you read the newspaper. And I think many of us are somewhat fed up with the negative images that not only of the newspapers, but the news reports and other, uh, let's say, things that are very trivial and 
that really tears down a person instead of building the person up. I didn't mention the star people. This is the term that the American Indians used to describe um, aliens that had come from another world. And from my research, most are, there are many people or cultures, the Brazilians, the Dogons in Africa, people in the Near East, the Far East, have mentioned that their ancestors came down from the sky. And again, as I said before, many people find this hard to believe, but I would go and research these people, research their culture to see exactly what they say that differs from the way our society presents these people. But basically, the thing that makes sense to me is that Western culture is a left brain culture. It's intellectual, it's rational, and it condemns those who don't agree with them, whereas, and I should also add that technology and consumerism, materialism, really leaves people not able to attach or connect with the right side of the mind. And as a result, the mind stays closed. Whereas the ancient civilizations employed both sides of their mind, and when you open up both sides of the mind, you feel serene, you feel like you're not really, how do you say it, uh, compelled to answer everything. I've heard people who state that, I don't want to answer something right away, I really need time to think this over, but I believe many people in our culture feel there is some type of higher intelligence where they can respond in a flat second. But again, our purpose on life or why we're here is to live truth. The more truth we live, we grow in morality and wisdom. There are, as I said before, there are several ways to uh, review what I've said. There's several ways to grow in wisdom and again I find the ancient books very very helpful to me. The ancient myths, you read a myth and you read of the dramatic events in the book and they will touch you in such a way that you feel you have been touched by something that perhaps you can relate to, but yet it just makes a person come alive. This is one of the things that Joseph Campbell said, that this will really stir up the imagination and you will find yourself being very highly uh, influenced by these stories. So, many people today are still wondering why we're here, what is our purpose on life? How do I do this? The ancient people knew that they had to wake up their greatest essence, the soul. They felt like they could do this if they lived truth. They put themselves in a big picture where everything was connected. According to the ancient alien theorists, these aliens do come back so every so often to help our society and it seems like our society is somewhat confusing the many wars that we're fighting the uh, problems of the recession the problems of let's say trying to live peacefully but if we realize that we are all one family this should bring more peace in the world the ancient Egyptians figured that they were microcosms mirroring the macrocosm, the universe, and if they live true in every area of their lives, that they will have harmony, peace, and they could get along. And our first purpose in life is to self-actualize, is to wake up this spirit that lies dormant within. And when we do this, we just find that life is full of bliss, that life is a lot of fun, and we do our best to help everybody else who hasn't waken up 
to have this great awakening. It's the same message that the Dalai Lama, Deepak Chopra, Osho, Gurdjieff have stated. We need to wake up. We have great talents within and we can really bless humanity if we wake up this great spirit that lies within. Okay? I believe this is all and I hope you did receive something out of this and as I said before, you have the boss. Do you have a question? Yes. All right, let's thank you. All right, okay. These are half brainers here. You said uh, that. They are man. You said that aliens have. You said that aliens have ancient wisdom that helps benefit mankind. Am I correct in that assumption? Let's say the ancient aliens were very superior to us, that they had certain abilities that we don't have. And let's say, because they had these abilities to disappear, to appear, and to move through walls and what have you, but we are limited in this particular instance. As, as a follow-up to your question then, do you think those aliens from Boston are ever going to bring the Cubs out of their uh, stores? Uh, <laughs> I'm silly. I have no comment. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Do you know, do they have an idea about when that happened? How long ago? Oh, I wrote about that in my book. I don't know if I uh, mentioned the year. I don't. Now, supposedly, Enoch knew Abraham. And Abraham lived somewhere near, I believe, the 19th century BC. So it could have been around that time, but I cannot give you a definite answer. Okay, so probably 2,000 years before Christ. I'm sorry, I, I just heard a comment that threw me off, so would you please repeat the question? So somewhere 2,000 years before Christ. Right. Okay, and that's approximately when, when you begin up with... I can't guarantee you, but as I said, many books mention the point that Abraham knew Enoch. Could it have been 5,000 years before Christ, or do you think it was less than that? I'm sorry that if I, as I said before, I don't like to just rattle off things, just be rattling off things, and of course I wrote the book, but I'm, I do make mistakes, or at least this is very difficult to come before a group and talk and to have the answers to everything, and I wrote this book maybe two, uh, eight years ago, and I had to rewrite it, and... By being in a clinical group, it is quite difficult to relax and just have the answers to roll off my tongue. You're doing fine. All right. Yes, please. I have a question. Um, from from what I understood, it, it seems like uh, you believe that the aliens, they were good-natured generally, right? And why, if that is the case? Supposedly, well, let's say the people who came from that bureau, the, the planet... They needed workers to mine gold. They came here to mine gold for their atmosphere. And so they had many, many exper experiments until they got it right. And then they created these so that the workers could take their place. Many writers, or at least some writers, say that there are some of these aliens who do have a bad agenda. But basically, we were created, our homo sapiens were created to take the place of the uh, aliens who were working in the gold mines to take the gold back to their home atmosphere. Their home atmosphere needed gold. And this is why the primitive workers were created. But if you could use the resources that there are some Anunnaki who do have uh, a negative agenda. But the first, they were created, they, they created us, our homo sapiens, to take their places in these gold mines. 
Did I answer your question? Yeah, you did. Okay. Any other questions? All right, Charles. Yeah, Jane. In your book, you say it's fascinating. Every aspect of the Egyptian knowledge seems to have been complete at the very beginning. Meaning, there was no change. There was no. Our society is based on technological development, but they had no development in over a three thousand year period of time. And it's a stagnant culture. Okay, what's a stagnant? Well, your implication is just that all they needed to know they already had. From these visitors, they are new who came to Egypt and built the pyramids, they built uh, the Sphinx, and many, I may have... All right, would you say, let me put it this way, was Egyptian civilization advanced or primitive? Well, it became advanced with the people who, let's say, the Anunnaki are the survivors from Atlantis. They came to Egypt and Many people believe that the pyramids and the Sphinx were built around 10,000 BC. And this is when Atlantis sank. And they, for some reason, knew that it was going to sink. So many went to Egypt, many went to Mexico, many went to Central America, South America. And when they went to Egypt, they built the pyramids. And this was around 10,000 BC. And Tahuti or Enoch was credited for building the pyramids. Can I get a follow up? Yes, go ahead. Okay, so these space guys come. And they showed them how to make cool big buildings out of stone, but they didn't teach them the germ theory of disease. They didn't teach what? The germ theory of disease. In the, um, I mean, they told us all about stone. Yeah. There is a, a, a program on ancient aliens which states that when these aliens come to Earth, there is usually a plague. There is usually some type of illness that follows. All right. There is a, you know, if you want to check this out, go to the uh, website and there is a particular program on that particular title. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Would it, to follow up on this question, would it be possible that when you were uh, at the time when the Anunnaki and the gods coming down to help us, could it be possible that there were no diseases I'm trying to help you guys. <laughs> when they got here? Like when <laughs> Columbia came here, certain diseases was not here. Right. Right. So advances in technology, what we call now, does that prove back then that the same technology was necessary? Well, as far as I know, the technology jump-started the civilization for the Earthlings. And the Earthlings, let's say, Primitive workers more or less just went to work and they did not have this wisdom that the aliens had. And the aliens wanted the earthlings to become like them in wisdom. Uh, a quick follow up. This one looks maybe a little more sensitive. Does, does advancement mean. You can build a computer, or does a master mean, or can mean other things? In other words, to be a to be a civilized, uh, 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 the people in Mexico, I keep forgetting. The Aztecs, the Mayans, Mayans. The Mayans. Mayans. Do you need a computer to be a Mayan? Do you need a, 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 a start your car from here out there to be smart? That's the question I'm trying to ask in reply to the person back here. <laughs> I still may be lost, but it seems I'm hearing something that's very similar to our country where we believe in progress. And just even in this last century, we went from, let's say, the horse and buggy to spacecraft. 
But do we have peace? Do we have harmony in our society today? So we can be very progressive, but yet if we lack the decency to treat people less than human, if we still cannot figure out how to live next door to each other without having you know arguments and petty strife, we need still work to be more harmonious with one another. I have a question myself, and that is uh, why this hypothesis uh, that uh, aliens from another world uh, had to interfere with uh, Egyptian civilization before they could build pyramids. I mean, I, it seems that the evidence is in Egypt is that they had a progression over centuries of building pyramids. And uh, they, you know, they, they developed a, uh, a very uh, technically proficient culture and, and uh, all sorts of uh, uh, theories about uh, how people should live and what uh, the relation of different uh, uh, powers uh, that uh, they worshipped uh, uh, were, and how they were related, and so on, and life after death, and so on. Before, um, I believe before civilization was given to the Egyptians, the Egyptians practiced cannibalism, and when they were given civilization, they cut this out, and around 10,000 BC, this is the time that the Anunnaki came to uh, ancient Egypt. And the Pantheon with Osiris as the head, uh, this, as I said before, is considered the world's oldest religion. So we have to go back to 10,000 BC, or even beyond that, when the Egyptians were still cannibals, when they did not practice a religion, and then when Osiris became the king, or in his mythology, there have been reports that there are many uh, copies of what we call the uh, Egyptian Book of the Dead in the coffins of ancient Egyptians because they value the um, cultivating of their souls so greatly that they had these books buried with them in their coffins. So, Osiris did make a great impact on the uh, people of ancient Egypt because they wanted to be like Osar. They wanted to have a good life here so they could be guaranteed that they would live on in the afterworld. But I credited yeah. this with uh, the first religion in the world, which was related to the Assyrian religion, which is related to the first golden age that Egypt had. Question? Um, I just wondered what your authority was that the pyramids were built 10,000 years ago because according to what I've read, they were built about 3,000 years ago, four and 3,000 years ago, and that actually the Egyptian civilization was predated by uh, the first civilization were the Sumerians and then the Babylonians, and so they predated Egyptian civilization. So I'm wondering where that fits into your timeline thing, because I don't think they have any pyramids that they've dated to 10,000 years Several go to Graham Han Hancock's website, and uh, there are other websites. I think the person that I called uh, this is And I do agree that Babylon and Samaria was the first. The Egyptians borrowed from uh, Samaria and the surrounding area. And uh, this sheet, the glossary I have, Osar or Osiris came from, there was uh, a Babylonian or Sumerian equivalent. And um, Marduk was a god of Babylon, but he was known as Ra in uh, ancient Egypt. But let me just. Okay. 
come the Lithuanians have no achievements? Yeah. <laughs> You're no achievements. <laughs> It is nothing. There are other, other sources, I don't remember, I can't find them in here, but there are other sources that seem the pyramids were constructed. I sure didn't talk Most, to the aliens. Okay, if we turn on the TV and, and it's a conventional program about ancient Egypt, they will say that they were built around 2500 BC or 3000 BC, but there are people who do say that they were built much earlier. Okay. I heard Pat, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to disrupt you, but my friend Dennis found what I was looking for. For some reason, I was thinking H Y is H U R D A K. Her tag wrote about a priest known as Enoch, who others have identified as another incarnation of Hermes Trismegistus. Enoch, like Hermes, is credited as the builder of the Great Pyramid, approximately 10,450 BC. He was the father of Methuselah and great grandfather of Noah. So you will find you will find conflicting uh, a lot of dates with ancient Egyptian mythology, not mythology, but history, especially with the Exodus. Some people believe that the Exodus never happened. But you'll find books that, uh, of course, are write about the Exodus. But there are some Egyptians, especially I think of Sadat, who told the uh, Israelis that we're sorry, we don't have anything about the Exodus in our history. Oh. Okay, so um, if assuming that, assuming that, um, I'm sorry. Yes. Oh, yes. Philip. Yes. Yeah. So assuming that uh, aliens have had a, a part in shaping human civilization in the past how many ever thousand years, what, what is the purpose, or is there a purpose, or is there a presence of modern aliens, and what is their, what's their place? I believe it was around, well, what do you want me to answer about the past? No, nothing really. Okay. I mean, assuming that all of that is true. Uh -huh. What is the purpose and what is the agenda going forward? Why, why, why do aliens still have a presence here on Earth, if you do believe it? Bring the Cubs to win the World Series. <laughs> aside the, aside the <laughs> <laughs> the I believe many books, I'm not, I think I've said this before, that <laughs> we're about to do something that may destroy the world, and if we do, there should be help from these people to tell us, you know, this is how things have to be. Many people believe that, I guess, the aliens are here for a dark agenda. And uh, I've read that there perhaps are like four different types of uh, aliens. You know, the small gray ones, there may be medium gray ones. And are they they, conflict with one another? It's almost like... If you look, the glossary that I gave you, the first, you know, in, in Will and Inky, they were half-brothers, and, you know, this stuff that's going on in the Middle East, it started way, way thousands of years ago. But, um, we feel that many people, I've read many, in many places that the aliens will come back if we are going to to the point of having a nuclear war. And when things just get so bad, they will come and intervene to help, you know, to save our world. But again, many people feel like the uh, aliens are here for a dark agenda. I've read a book maybe 16 years ago that said that they're here already. And they are. I just don't, you know, that's one thing I don't want to believe. And I just find it hard to believe. I'm, and the, I'm not great. saying I don't believe it, but <laughs> it ha I haven't accepted it yet. One at the college. Yeah, <laughs> so, uh, as I said before, there are several uh, forms and types. Some may be eight feet tall, ten feet tall. They may look like us. But according to the Bible, these people, we were made in their image. And we have to more or less use their intelligence if we want to have a more peaceful society. One more follow-up to that. Um, 
So wh 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 why, why do they still have such a vested interest in our well-being at this point? As I said, uh, you going to ask? You because I still feel like they're supposed to stop us if we're going to have this third so war. Why, why do they care? I guess if, if we're made, we we are hybrids, so we're yeah, somewhat nice. related to them. Yeah, they're a problem. Yeah, oh, brother. Nice. Question over here. Somebody who has, has got to take care of them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, I'd like to ask a question. How does human evolution fit into your timeline? How does the human evolution over more than 100,000 years from more primitive versions of human beings to the present uh, so-called homo sapiens that I have my doubts about uh, fit into your timeline? Yeah. Okay. She came from monkey. A part of the distinction, these aliens first came here maybe a half million, pardon me, half a million years before the time of Christ, before the time of Jesus. And um, going back to 10,000 BC, there were still, let's say, relatives of the aliens. People like Noah and Tuzla, they lived 900 years, 500 years. So I would have to say these uh, survivors of Atlantis were like the last of the Anunnaki who helped uh, bring about civilization to our Earth. And not only did they go to Egypt, but they went to other places around the world. And I would say 10,000 BC would be a good day. So in other words, the time of the writing of the Rig Vedas, the actual 10,000 year old religion which was developed in India. There was even even one of the uh, the gods, I guess it was Ishtar, she had control of India. So there's just a uh, thing that is connected to all of these. All right. So, so you subscribe to what some of these authors think, that there were battles between the different alien races back in ancient times? Yeah, it's, again, the, uh, the half-brothers, Anlil, uh, Anki and they fought over the control of Earth, <clears throat> or the control of the gold mines. And like I said before, this conflict in the Middle East goes back to thousands of years ago. But basically, uh, you can trace this back to on. Anki and Anlil, and they were they were able to use nuclear weapons. And when you use when you read, if you get a chance to read the uh, Lost Book of Anki, you'll find how these two fought, how uh, sides were uh, you know against one another, and how one of the gods uh, came to Earth, found the gold, but then he was banished to go to Mars, and. Cain was banished to come to America. So you'll find something that's very, very interesting in these books. But what was the full name of that book, Lost Book on? That sounds like a good read. <laughs> the Lost Book of Inky, E N K I. Inky, yeah. Memoirs and Prophecy of an Extraterrestrial God. You. you can get a printout because I have it on the printout. Get a I don't know how to explain this, but 
many people are very reluctant to report these because people will classify people who have had these experiences as crazy and many people don't want to believe it. Then you probably know that the government hides uh, the evidence that these these um, <laughs> hello, hello. Okay. All right, Charlie's got a question. Charlie. Yeah, Gene, is it possible that the ancient people didn't listen to any astronauts? They just listened to the priestly class who told them to do this stuff? and the gods would be happy and not punish them or something, or avert disaster. Like I've always said, don't listen to the priestly class, whatever you do. <laughs> the uh, astronauts, they had communication devices very similar to our cell phones that could communicate from their home planet to uh, yeah. not ex I don't know what you call them, but they had the I have to say they were devices. I can't say cell phones, but they had they could communicate from planet to planet. And of course, Anu was the god, and many I, I imagine their name Anunnaki was related to um, the name of the god. And as I said before, they were quite superior. One of their years equal 3,600 of our years, and they just lived for a long, long time, but it seems as if they were more, I guess if you live a long time, there must be something that, that people do right, and I guess this is something that people who are writing books today are stating that we need to be more spiritual, we need to be more kind to people, we need to be more more pleasant, and all negative energy, whether it's anger, arrogance, it has a very, very bad effect, and uh, <coughs> these particular behaviors should not be expressed. And they are signs of weakness, there are signs of inner development that, that has not taken place. So again, many people have said we should be a race of messiahs, a race of saviors, or a race of Buddhas, and at one time, the Christian religion, Greek mythology, and Buddhism all had the same goal to become one with the source of all life. But besides, after that, we have to help society or help humanity because many are still confused about what we're here to do. And many feel like if they can intimidate people, if they can be arrogant, they can have their way. But it's a heavy, one pays a heavy price for arrogance. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, my dear. Uh, why is it that we have moved off the gold standard? Uh, and what is the interest of these aliens in Fort Worth? When it comes to money and gold, I'm, I'm very, very, let's say, I cannot discuss it. I just. I'm a spendthrift, and I don't know the best in things, but when I get money, it just goes to... Okay. Uh, I'll become very, very materialistic. Two questions. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, you talk about Adam and Eve. Is there any room in this pantheon for Lilith? <laughs> Even though um, I learned that she was Adam's first wife, Edward uh -huh. Casey discusses her. <laughs> Uh, well, apparently, I don't know, and I don't think she really cares, or I just got to say, but um, I found this out several, I may have read about her several years ago, but on the, uh, the History Channel, you know, Lil did not want to give in to, you know, she did not want to take a submissive role to Adam and told Adam, you know, I'm not going to do this and I'm going to do that, so, you know, I'll just leave, but uh, again, Check these things out for yourself, and I found out that Zeus had another wife before Hera. And like uh, Zeus's father swallowing uh, his kids, he swallowed uh, his first wife. But again, these are Zeus, these are myths. So, you know, we're not to, to confuse them as, you know, actual history. 
Um, All right, Tim. I'm just curious. What's your rational scientific basis for believing in all this stuff? As the, um, the History Channel, of course, um, Western Society, I read a, I read a uh, website, a paper on the website yesterday, and it was on Atlantis, and what we cannot explain, such as these myths, we call them legends, we call them myths. But as the theorists, the ancient alien theorists are saying, these people wrote down what they saw. And again, I read um, something on the internet about Elijah, his ability, his capabilities, that he could build a house or a palace overnight. And it was similar to what I read of my particular favorite version of Aladdin that Aladdin told Genie one night to build him a palace and the next morning the palace was constructed. And we do not know what powers these people have. And one of the things I, I one of the things that, okay. When people pull their energies together, it's quite possible to create miracles. And one of the um, episodes of Stargate, the people were chanting, and I believe a megalith appeared. And what I'm trying to say is acoustics and chanting and pulling people's energies together. We can create miracles. Many people believe that the pyramids were constructed with a communal pull of energy. The Gothic cathedrals were built with the Sufi workers chanting songs, singing songs, passing the bricks to one another, and you'll be surprised of how songs, chants, and just pulling your energy together, they can perform miracles for people. Yes, Charles. Yeah, Jane. I'm Lithuanian, and this, historically, is one of the oldest ethnic groups in the world. And these people, Lithuanians, sadly enough, are still kind of like Stone Age people. <laughs> what happened? Why would we never share in this? We don't have any monuments. You know, or nothing. Bad attitude. What's it? Yeah, we have a bad attitude or what? I think you're a good living example, Charlie. For one, for some reason, I want to say keep your old ways because the old ways may be more meaningful to you than people who want to jump on the materialistic technology. Oh, but one thing I do want to say about Lithuanians, my aunt, who had a voice instructor uh, from Lithuania, uh, the voice instructor's husband passed away, and after the funeral, the, the the uh, voice instructor came home and she you know, took off her wedding garb and they all started dancing. So I believe the Lithuanians do have a knowledge of the, the, the travel of the soul that when people die, we're not supposed to go into a grieving uh, period, but we're supposed to celebrate yeah. the fact that these people have gone home and that their soul <laughs> will be reunited, will be in another body. So I believe every culture has some way to cling to the ways of the past because the ways of the past are more meaningful than our hip hop generation, our, our modern generation. I was in uh, Holland, this is 2001 before, um, thank you, I think it was maybe a month, and I was wa watching a talk show, and after the talk show ended, there were people, young and old, who got on the stage and they did a folk dance. And I thought that was just quite unique, that they kept something from the old culture. Because the old culture, even these rites and rituals, connected the people to those who brought down the rites and rituals.
to the people to give them some type of a reference to follow and even song and dance. Our Osar, our Osiris used song and dance to spread civilization around the world. Okay. Well, Margaret, yes. Have you, do you know who Virginia Hamilton was and did you ever read her compilation of creation myths? Edith Hamilton that wrote a book about creation myths and had all of them. Did you ever read that? I talked from the book several times. Uh, and I just one of my no, favorite myths is the myth of uh, Tantalus. And that myth is supposed to serve still today the definitive lesson in not being arrogant. And this is the thing with our society. We have just like thrown the myths, thrown all wisdoms away, and this is the way that we will rule the world. And again, we trans we just go over spiritual laws. We do not abide by mosaic laws. We say do not kill. So we make up our own laws. And this is the one thing that people were very critical about the founding fathers because the founding fathers did not follow the cosmopolitan European model for civilization nor did they find, follow the sacred holistic model. So they said we would do, make up our ways and rules. I think I better change the and uh, the battery in the speaker. Yeah. We'll hold on for a moment. Yes. He needs an alien helper. Yes. Yes. Uh, yeah. oh. yes. Uh, yeah. oh. yes. Uh, yeah. 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 yeah, we can hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. I um I must have had four or five copies of Edith Hamilton's uh, book at home and last spring my apartment was painted and I think I threw every I can't find any copies now, but uh I like to I like to refer to that myth because you know, as I said before, our culture does not follow wisdom. And when we don't follow wisdom, we have to pay for that. And the story of Tantalus is supposed to be the number one story for people not to display arrogance, not to insult people, not to go and brag and boast, and not to test the omniscience of God. And all of us have omniscience. And when we test people's omniscience, we put ourselves in that predicament that Tantalus put himself. And when he cut up his son and served it to the gods, the gods found out he was sent to hell and he could never ever grasp water from the pool or trees from uh, fruit from the fruit trees. So in the sense, people who are very, very arrogant, they cannot... They'll be that way forever. They cannot receive food or water for spiritual nourishment, so they will go through eternity being more arrogant or just not really finding their true self. Alright. If that uh, ends your questions for the speaker for the evening, we will proceed to your rebuttals, uh, your remarks. Uh, I want to know how many of you have remarks to make to the rest of us. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Uh, About six minutes. Uh, no. uh, I think, uh, up to six minutes each, which you will be allowed. So that uh, some of you may be inspired later. But, uh, okay. Done we have questions? a system here. Uh, beginning no more questions? No. Uh, Francisco yeah. Aguilar on that end. We play musical chairs with the uh, line of speech. Yeah. Francisco. All right. Speaker. 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 Already cut my thunder because he said we shouldn't insult each other. <laughs> <laughs>
I will do my best not to be smart ass. But I have to be truthful to myself and to you. And uh, the speaker said that talk is cheap. And it's cheap for both of us, for him as well as for us. If you read a lot of bullshit, you will have acquired a lot of bullshit, but no knowledge. <laughs> he he, he talked a lot about aliens. He didn't bring any factual anything. He said he read Van Daniken. Well, I not only read Van Daniken, I follow him on different expeditions that he I read. And it's totally disproven what he was talking about. Uh, <coughs> It has been proven that violent death was more common in ancient societies. Yeah. And some that he mentioned as something that we should follow. Should we follow them? We should go back to killing each other by hammering the head? Yeah. Uh, if you keep involving Jesus, you will get in deep trouble with a lot of Christians. Jesus in a space motorcycle? Dude, that's cool. Yeah. I think it was our purpose in life. You don't know, you do not know yet. Is to fuck each other. <laughs> Simple as that. I mean, do, do you have any disagreement with that, anybody? Uh, we are looking around, see who, who, who we can catch the fuck up. <laughs> this is the society we live, and probably this is what humans are uh, up to now. Uh, if you see this is 400 BC wrote about that uh, when you remove the veneer of of uh, thin veneer of society from a society underneath you find hell on earth people killing each families there is no restrictions in our behavior when we don't have these people looking at, at us from every every direction. Um, uh, he keep mentioning the Bible as a source. I mean, guys, when are we going to wake up? Uh, the Bible is not a source for history. Um, I was promoting my idea that most humans are domesticated. It started 10,000 years ago with the advent of cultivation. Uh, he read the day back to a million years about our domestication by aliens. Um, if you are interested in domestication of the human being, go into the uh, Google and Google the domestication of the silver fox, and that is a starting point in understanding what I'm talking about domestication of the human, which is that the inability to, to grow up to adulthood. We, we somehow stay in this state of youth where we couldn't visualize concepts of consequences of delayed uh, gratification and things like that. And uh, uh, oh, and then he, he, he had to book in his book to remember the dates. I mean, I, I am not a scientist, I am not I'm an engineer. But yet, if I present a project, man, you can ask me anything about that project from the day that they started, 10, 20, 30 years ago, and I can tell you every number, every day, everything that is involved with my project. So the speaker doesn't remember the important dates that, that he put in the book. That's not. That's not uh, acceptable. Hi, long time since I've been here, but I'm always happy I come. Um, I somehow always managed to learn something, and this today was no exception. Um, I was amazed that the power of the written word. Um, you can write something in a book, <coughs> put something on the internet, and people will read it and make it part of themselves. Right. It is simply amazing and frightening. Um, the other
other side to that coin, of course, are that we all read books. And of course, everything we read is also not true. Um, the other side of that coin is that about 10 years ago, 15 years ago, there was a Watt, 15 years ago, the Watts riots in L.A. No, 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 no. This was the stuff in um, Rodney King's incident. Oh, oh, okay. So Rodney King, you, you saw, some of you may not remember, was uh, captured on video being beaten by the police. That didn't cause the riots. Then he went to trial. Then the police went to trial. And the police were um, found innocent. Okay. And many, many people in this country thought that was a miscarriage. Okay. And then the riots broke out at once. But some people took that and said, in 50 years from then, which is like 40 years from today, people won't riot when they see evidence such as the beating, a video of police beating somebody. And the reason is because by then, people will be trained not to believe anything they see. Because there will be such manipulation of visual evidence that everybody will already, you know, have seen the video of Abe Lincoln dancing with Marilyn Monroe. Okay. And they will learn not to believe what they see in video. So, what I learned today was that the written word has extraordinary power. And what it also brought to mind was that the visual also has extraordinary power, and will, that will be lost. And that the other sides of all those coins is that we are all victims of what we see and what we read. So basically, nothing is easy. I'm going to repeat that one. Some of my best friends are aliens. <laughs> a few of them live in Wisconsin and some of them live in Indiana, but they're not ancient, they're relatively contemporary. Um, Brother Crowley gives us very cogent arguments against deism. If all of the things that most people attribute to God or gods was actually done by these ancient aliens uh, who were not gods, then there's no reason to worry about God. Um, the grid system that Brother Crowley, Crowley re, uh, referred to uh, was not defined until uh, the uh, 18th century, I'm sorry, the 19th century, when our very accurate chronographs, clocks, were able to determine the distance east and west of uh, a certain point, which is called uh, uh, Greenwich, uh, England, right now. Uh, so. Prior to that, we did have a general sense of north and south, but we had no way of measuring east and west. Um, the race of giants that Brother Crowley referred to uh, is very interesting. Remember that the Semitic people are very small by comparison with contemporary standards. Um, you know, right, I'm, uh, the, uh, on average, they were five foot two, five foot three. Maybe some were five foot four. They're very, very small people, as contrasted with the Neanderthals and the Lithuanians. <laughs> many, of them, many of whom are well over six feet tall. Um, ben Donakin and his, uh, his 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 books. In one of his uh, diet uh, books. Uh, he, he refers to the 
images on the Altacama, the, the high desert of Peru and Ecuador, where the, you can see huge images uh, on, on scales of miles that were put into, the, uh, into the, the ground, carved into the ground apparently by the native people there in uh, honor or in homage, homage to their, uh, uh, the, uh, the aliens. Well, it turns out that uh, one of my former colleagues, uh, Phyllis Pitluga, who's now the uh, uh, emeritus astronomer from the Adler Planetarium, uh, made a study of those images in the up high desert. And we don't see them now because we don't, we, we can't grasp the idea now. But in, in the high desert, and especially in the southern hemisphere, the Milky Way is incredibly bright and it has very large dark spots in it. These are clouds of gas. And if you look at the certain times of the year directly above one of these images, you'll find the same image in the clouds of dust all around. So that was uh, those images by Van Donneken attributed to homage to the uh, space aliens was nonsense. Um, the universe is 3.78 billion years old. Humanity has been around for about 100,000 years. Um, science, as we know it, is about 500 years old. Engineering is a little bit older than that, quite a bit older than that, uh, because people had to build those you know, Gothic cathedrals, the pyramids, Stonehenge. And to, to, to attribute our skills skills to uh, uh, influences from aliens, I think, is, is, is a disservice to humanity. Uh, I want to thank this speaker, the keynote speaker from last week, uh, for one thing in particular, and that is uh, now we can get up there and ramble around aimlessly over a million things, uh, never pull anything together with any kind of cogent theory, or for that matter, have any proof or scientific evidence whatsoever to present for all of these rambling opinions. Which brings up uh, someone who I studied uh, very carefully in my youth, and I think foolishly, whose name was Aleister Crowley. Now, uh, Crowley uh, was another one of these uh, innumerable charlatans who came up with all sorts of uh, pseudo-theories uh, for whatever personal reason. Uh, in his case, he did want to get laid, so I have to... Uh, <laughs> and he did. Very very back, back, yeah. very uh, and uh, he went so far as to collect quite a lot of money <coughs> to preserve a sacred object in a temple after his death that being his penis. A anyway, uh, Crowley, however, did uh, actually publish a whole number of very interesting books. One of them was Book Four, which discussed pranayama, which was the yogic uh, practice of breathing. And uh, another one was uh, Book 777 in the first edition and revised which was a comparative religion in which he took all, took all the various gods of whatever religions uh, were around uh, and available to him as far as reading material in the 19th century and uh, to make up uh, some parallels between them. Uh, so uh, being that, that I can simply <laughs> ramble on and on and talk all kinds of stuff. Uh, only for six minutes. Only for six minutes. That gets us into the, the Bible and the New Testament. And of course, the New Testament was put together by a conference of bishops 300 years after the death of Christ in the Conference of Nicosia. And they just uh, decided certain books were the Word of God and certain books were not. And here we have the Word of God. So, you know, this is one big piece of the foundation of all this nebulous philosophical <coughs> meandering that we now can feel free to continue on uh, and on and on. So uh, before I bore you completely to death, I'd like to say <laughs> goodbye.
Well, the speaker replied there was uh, too much arrogance around. I'll agree with that. Uh, occasionally, I've uh, had that problem myself. <laughs> uh, but I just want to take up just one item, the idea of uh, how did these pyramids or how did these structures come about? And I remember recently in reading uh, Jared Diamond's book, Collapse. You pick up the book, you don't have to read the whole book. It's about five or 600 pages. Very interesting. But one part talks about, I believe, Easter Island. Again, my facts are a little bit uh, foggy. But he uh, explained why these huge, I think you, you probably all remember that, there's these huge uh, statues, immense statues of faces uh, all over the island. And he explains how they were developed. And uh, you, uh, he explains to them fairly simple terms of stuff they had at that time, like rollers and, uh, and uh, 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 ramps and uh, levers that they were able to uh, produce these items, roll them in place, and set them up uh, with these very, very simple tools. And uh, they didn't, as I recall, they didn't even have any big draft animals. But in uh, producing all these things, they used up all the wood on the island. Didn't have a damn bit of wood left. And I think it was in the 19th century when Europeans discovered the island. Uh, they came to see these uh, native peoples who were in leaky boats, uh, and the first thing the peoples asked them about is, do you have any lumber? They had, and putting these statues up, they had used up every darn bit of lumber on the island. I mean, there's nothing left. So I would uh, suggest, if nothing else, read that chapter. It's very interesting. Bye. Uh, if uh, some of these, y'all did a little reading, uh, this speaker's speech would be so effective. Now, if they did a survey and went out in the public and say, do you believe in us? God, do you believe in uh, deism? 80%, 90% of the people would say yes. Yeah. 90% of the people say yes. Yeah. Now he talks about ancient uh, 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 people coming from other places to give us what we what we uh, should be proud of now. Now people, listen. The library is cheap. I don't remember paying shit when I was in the library. <laughs> you can go in the library and you can get Homer, Hazard, Virgil, Dante. What were these people? They were poor. You could also get the pre-Socratics, like that, Heraclitus, and Axagoria. They talked about these things that uh, the, the speaker was talking about. Not the, uh, I don't mean the, 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 the pre-Socratics, but, but the, the poets, the Greeks. And if you read the Old Testament, you will see that they stole that shit from Hezad and Homer and Midnight and so forth. It ain't nothing but another book of poetry. Yet you got all kinds of people believing in this. Give me a break, please. And ethnocentrism ain't gonna get you shit. My daddy can whoop your dad. My daddy said, well, how you know my daddy can whoop your dad? So my daddy can eat glass. So how you know, how you know your, your daddy can't eat no glass? He said, I, 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 did you see it? He said, no, but I heard him tell mom that if you turn the light off, I eat it. <laughs> what's, the, what's the moral of this story? Now, I mentioned that, not to be a dirty storyteller. I mentioned that to tell you that the lead little boy was only six and seven. Give me a break, please. I can forgive a six and seven year old, but a 37 year old asshole tell me about my country is better than yours, my day is better than yours, and my so on. So give me a fucking break, man. Oh, there must have oh, been, you were, just like youngsters now, he, he thinks the world started when he was born. 
when he went to school the, yesterday, the world was born. The same way with this goddamn uh, 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 country. This ain't the first fucking country in the world. It ain't going to be the last one. <laughs> and to sit around and talk about how superior you are to this and your science is this, your science. But well, I'm 75 fucking years old. I ain't got to read about them 75 fucking years because I was here. <laughs> I don't see a goddamn thing so advanced. I don't want to have, don't have a computer. Never on a fucking television in my life. I got a car that got windshield wipers on the, on the fucking uh, headlight. <laughs> Lock your door. That's what the, 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 the car said, yeah, I... I, I Am I proud? Does that mean that I'm supposed to degrade a culture hundreds of years ago that have no kind of problem similar to her, to, to ours? Here's some child over there. Uh, did they tell you uh, something about the uh, history of uh, bacteria? And so it'd be a fucking break then. They didn't have the silly shit that we got. And now they give you shit here because they want you to buy some drugs. They tell you, say, oh, your cholesterol is high. And you got to for the rest of your life take drugs for your cholesterol. Oh, you got high blood pressure. They getting billions of dollars milking your ass. Oh, and you call that science. I call that thievery. Just like I call it, oh, you probably call Wall Street banking. I call that thievery. Give me a great plea. Now, if I had to make a gift, oh, and by the way, like, oh, if you read this stuff, you you will find out that the priests. The, 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 the premier, the premier, the king and queen, and the heads of state, they take this shit and they give it to the masses to anesthetize them. Yeah. It's like religion. Now, they do that, like, uh, like uh, uh, Ed, Ed Rio said over there, the words are very dangerous. And when you are dumb, you show nothing in trouble. Because they throw words around like they throw rice at a wedding. <laughs> throw rice at a wedding. A word is something that we read on as a similar to approximate what we want to communicate. You can't, a word ain't a substitute for the thing, the idea, or the, or, or the, or the uh, uh, thought. So when you let people write beautiful uh, poetry, beautiful uh, research paper, or uh, whatever it is, and have it passed on to you like this is real. They do this for the same reason they pass on religion to, to you. Ain't a country I ever read about in no book, no that was against religion. He might be against the one that you got here and you try to bring it over there. All of them ain't a country in the world that ain't uh, uh, defending of their religion. Why? Because they use it for the same place the other country uses for the emphasize the matter. And they take this uh, 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 portrait that home, Homer and Hazard never rip, and they steal it and, and become religious, religious dogma. Religious dogma. People, give me a break, please. All you have to do is go to the library and read a few books. And all you have to do is say, hey, I'm somebody. I got a mind. Fuck that dead author. Fuck that priest. Fuck the president. Fuck the guy in charge. I'm somebody because I'm a human being. And why? I can say that because I'm equal to him. How I know I'm equal to him? Because we both is on our way to Rose Hill Cemetery or some other plot that you bought. And if he can stay out of Rose Cemetery, now he can tell me anything. And if he can't, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, I don't know how I can possibly call on that one. I don't want to be um, thank you very much, Mr. Crowley, for your presentation tonight. I appreciate it. And um, you know, I, just, I just wanted to say one thing. Um, a lot of people, because they their introduction to Frankenstein is through the movie rather than through the book, they miss that beautiful section where Victor goes off to Bavaria to go to college. And he meets with his professor, and he tells his professor what he's been reading. And he's like, oh, I've been reading Cornelius Agrippa, and he names off this whole list of authors. And his professor slaps himself on the head. He's like, oh, good God, I'm not to spend the first year unteaching you. You've just wasted several years of your life. And I couldn't help but think of we're going through this long list of authors. It's like, yes, they've published, they've come up with all these theories, but it's like studying alchemy in the 20th century, you know? I mean, I don't know. I, I'm very Emersonian when it comes to this. It's not about what you read. It's about the quality of what you read and then how you connect that to your world. And um, what I saw tonight just did not resonate with me. 
but then I'm a Marxist, so I'm not really interested in questions of ontology, and I'm more interested in phenomenology. What is the world as it is? You know, not where it came from. And I'm sure that there are people that find those questions really interesting. I find them kind of dull because they're ultimately unprovable. You always have to come back to some sort of God term, whatever it is. Uh, and I'm more interested in, as I look at the world as it is, and accepted flaws and all, what is it that we can do in this world that we're in now to make it a better place? Um, so that's just kind of where I'm at right now. And so shifting gears entirely to questions of phenomenology, I just wanted to talk a little bit about uh, my experience with the Occupy Chicago movement. I don't know if you all have been down there at all. I've gone by during my lunch breaks. And then also after work, just to show, you know, to show the world that there are all different kinds of people in this movement and to talk to people as they go by. And I had the privilege to um, lead a teach-in uh, last weekend on public space. And one of the things we were talking about in talking about public space in Chicago is how we really have none. And how what's already happened is that the city has found ways to monetize it. So our public space is primarily for the tourists and also for the corporations of so Bank of America, you know, I can put their signs on our bridges and we can have all these festivals and so forth. And uh, exactly, exactly. Um, and we were talking about ways to creatively take back that space. How can we let the city know that we're aware that this is public space and we want to use it as such. And one thing we did that I thought was, um, it was not only fun, but it also got a lot of great, great conversations going. There was the caroling, of course, the groups were doing over the weekend. But a group of us decided to go over to the uh, Christmas market and dance. So we went over there and danced for a while at Daily Plaza. It just reminded them that Daily Plaza is not just for celebrating St. Mickey Mouse and selling lots of plastic <laughs> shit. Um, I had to give a shout out to you, my friend. It's one of my favorite <laughs> phrases. Uh, I actually I shared it at a conference, and, and, and you got a lot of praise from people on that. They liked that. They thought that was an excellent way of describing our relationship to the Chinese market. Um, but in any event, we've been doing little things like that, and that's that's really what's what's on my mind a lot these days, is sort of as we look at all of the things that frustrate us and drive us crazy, you know, how can we find things that we can actually do? Um, and that was one thing that we were doing, so that's that's one thing on my mind. The other, um, and I've done some work with some of the smaller Occupy movements. As, you, as some of you may know, I'm an educator. I have uh, two positions. I have a dual appointment at both Columbia College uh, and also at UIC. And one of the things we've been talking about is the rising cost uh, of education, which is something that really concerns me. Um, I was talking to one student at Columbia College. He's in his sophomore year, and he's $56,000 in debt. And he's not, he's not profligate, he's not throwing his money out the window, he didn't buy a car, he's not living in a high-rise condo, he's just paying the basic bills that it takes to get him through school. And this young man's 19 years old, and he's already having to make compromises. Uh, so he has this great dream, and he told me, he's like, I don't know if I'm going to be able to live it, because I'm already $56,000 in debt. Frankly, I don't even know if I'll be able to finish my bachelor's degree. And as he's saying that to me, it just fills me with great sadness, because... You know, regardless of whether we were created by aliens and the Mickey Mouse Club, that bottle of A1 over there, whoever the hell created us, if we don't have an educated citizenry, we're, we're screwed. Yeah. We're in trouble. And what I see happening increasingly is that education is becoming something that only the super rich and the elite will be able to get. And they won't even really need to do anything. They'll just go there, they'll get their little piece of paper, and that'll be their status symbol. And then for the rest of us, I guess we'll be stuck with the University of Phoenix if we're lucky enough to pay for a class or two online. And that really just makes me sick. It really makes me sick because I see what I do not simply as a business. And I hear that so much from the masters that I work for, that our students are consumers, right? And what can we do for them, you know? Education's a duty. It's a duty that I have. What I received in my degree was a, um, was a gift that I am, you know, that I have to give back to people. And, and I just, like I said, it just it makes me sick as I look at it. Um, but I'm proud to be a part of these movements to try to do what I can, because as many of you, and I know we've had these conversations around here, are very just frustrated with seeing things as bad as they are and not being able to do anything. So if you have not had a chance to drop by, even for a little bit, I encourage you to do so. If for nothing else, just to show the world that the Occupy movement is not a bunch of lazy hippies. 
sitting around, not a bunch of, you know, anarchists going out to smash windows or whatever. We're just ordinary people who are really frustrated with the status quo and want a better life, not just for ourselves, but for the future generations. So, thank you very much. First off, I'd like to thank the speaker for giving an excellent summary of one of the top ten blacked out subjects in America over the last 60 years. Many of you know me from the last four years of giving talks here. Frank? Frank? Please. For those of you that don't know, uh, this book, Censored News, Project Censored, is published every year by the Sonoma State University School of Journalism. It's one of the most prestigious journalism projects on the planet. They sort through about 600 stories and call it down to the top 25 that are blacked out by the mainstream media in America. The top 25 stories that would change our country overnight for the better if they were covered rather than intentionally blacked out. This book Alien Agenda was published in the first in 1997 by the investigative reporter Jim Mars. I have four copies of this tonight. If anybody wants to save a trip to Barnes & Noble and Borders, come see me afterwards. This is probably one of the top ten life-changing books you can read. Books have a tremendous amount of value if they are summarizing stuff that is true rather than promoting intellectual garbage that uh, Bertrand Russell called the stunting and distorting of the minds of the young in what is called education. If you can teach young people and get young people to believe, for example, that humans rode young dinosaurs like ponies and horses 6,000 years ago when everything was created, then you are raising a whole generation of people who will just disavow everything they read or see or hear until one of their leaders says, this is what you're supposed to believe. And this is what we've got in America today uh, with the right-wing media, the mainstream media, promoting an agenda in America to the point. This, this book and other journalism books, this is Censor News, this is the 2012 edition, Project Censor points out that Americans are almost unique in the world. Amer people living in America believe certain pieces of mythology that other people in the world uh, say, well, that's ridiculous. How can you believe that shit? It's because our media runs a two-pronged process. One, they promote the myth, and the other prong is they black out all the evidence to the contrary. So you can promote, if you can promote uh, the idea that the Earth is flat, and simultaneously black out Albert Einstein and 10,000 of his friends from the physics departments everywhere, you might be able to raise young children thinking the earth is flat. But uh, they don't really teach the earth is flat anymore because many people have had seen books that have pictures taken from the space shuttle and from the moon landings. So uh, 800 years ago, uh, intelligent, learned people used to debate whether the earth is flat or round. Today we don't debate that because the answer is no. 30 years ago, oh well, maybe it was 20 years ago, we, uh, a lot of us here, were considered to be raving lunatics for talking about smoke-free restaurants. We'll never have smoke-free restaurants. Smokers have a God-given right to light up and puff away anywhere. And you were infringing on their civil rights if you talked about a smoke-free restaurant where people could eat in peace without inhaling something that they were allergic to. It's an idea whose time has come. Since 1997, People have been carrying cameras with cell phones. The technology of lightweight, portable cameras has gotten so cheap and portable that people whip out their cameras and film stuff up close and personal. There's a book on the Gulf Breeze sightings written about 10, 12 years ago. There were so many UFO sightings and landings in and around the area of Gulf Breeze, Florida, with aliens walking around interacting with the people that a guy wrote a book about it, the Gulf Breeze sightings. But one man took his film into the sheriff's office and said, 
we can't get any sleep. There's so much going on around here. They're landing on the back lawn and everything else. What are you going to do about this? And the sheriff says, this is in, I think it was in like 2002, the sheriff says, you saw swamp gas. I'm officially empowered to tell you you saw swamp gas. So he whips out his camera and says, Sheriff, look at this. See that little guy in the silver suit that's about four feet tall standing next to my cousin Homer? Does that look like swamp gas to you? That's the essence of the learning experience that the human race is going through. Our own CIA in 1988 talked about in the book called The Disclosure Project and, and dozens of others. Our CIA had a program uh, just before the Berlin Wall came down. They were tracking the other four civilizations out here that are acting interacting with the human race. Our own government had a program to track four others count the human race. There's five that we know of and uh, many others that are suspected. There's all kinds of evidence uh, that the human race has not been alone. Our Navy has been tracking a whole body of submarines since about 1968, since we got sonar that could search down in the water. You know, the ancients, when something fell in the water, it went down and 50 feet it was gone. You couldn't track it. In 1968, there was a submarine tracking operation off the coast of Florida, and they logged on to this fast-moving submarine. They thought it was a Russian bogey or something, and that it was part of the training experiment, but. This thing was 150 miles an hour underwater, three times better than the Russian or American best nuclear subs. They tracked this one object uh, down to 20,000 feet back and forth for four days. So that was when our Navy uh, learned that there was a third body of submarines and whoever's running them on the planet, they're not ours, not Russian. A lot of the bases appear to be down uh, 20,000 feet down. Also, one final thought I'll leave because I picked up a minute from somebody else. The astronauts had, uh, they have pictures of alien spacecraft, alien spacecraft following them to the moon and back. The moon has big structural glass constructions on it. On the earth we have structural steel that buildings are made out of. On the moon they got structural glass. NASA has been keeping those uh, pictures for 50 years. There's all kinds of alien activity going on in this part of the galaxy, and uh, we're interacting with them. So we may talk a little bit about that on February 11th when I give an updated talk on uh, media blackouts in America and <laughs> solutions to the process. Thanks. Yes, uh, thank you for that, uh, Andy. Uh, I want to say, uh, uh, some of you know I've done a couple talks here about uh, UFOs and the evidence for them, especially uh, the evidence that uh, some have crashed and uh, been retrieved by our government and that our government, of course, has been covering up uh, what they know uh, about these UFOs. Uh, the evidence uh, that they've been visiting since uh, certainly 1948 uh, is much more credible than the evidence that they uh, visit us in the past. Um, but there's it's such a lot of complications involved with this about the determining how many of uh, alien races there might be, um, how much, uh, you know, which race has which technology or which capabilities. Uh, that it's um, uh, it's hard to uh, sort it all out and also hard to keep up with things. But uh, there's a lot of credible evidence about uh, UFOs visiting uh, this uh, Earth since 1948. And uh, some, somewhat uh, more going back to the Aurora uh, crash uh, in uh, Texas, Aurora, Texas, uh, something like 1900, 1895, something like that. Um, less so is the credibility for the ancient aliens thing. I mean, I remember very well when I was, uh, uh, like in high school, when uh, the Von Daniken book came out, uh, devouring it and just being almost uh, totally convinced uh, that... Uh, uh, so much of this stuff, uh, you know, Mayan uh, carvings and whatnot, uh, uh, were some evidence of ancient aliens. And then, of course, uh, the archaeologists would uh, come out and say, well, that one uh, uh, bas relief, I guess you'd call it, uh, uh, with the uh, Palenque queen, uh, king, that's, he's sitting on flames. And, well, first of all, of course, <laughs> ancient aliens have visited us from another. Um, uh, solar system would probably not be using rockets, um, and uh, although, well, maybe they gave the primitive rocket to some lackey on the Earth, but uh, <laughs> the the fact that the archaeologists did have an explanation for what these what these flame-like uh, carving uh, was underneath the, the, how he was seated uh, sort of debunked that, and then, of course, um, Von Daniken 
was very sloppy in his research, which has been proven uh, numerous times. Uh, uh, one of his things was that uh, the Egyptians had an island called the Elephantine Island. Uh, well, he uh, claimed that, well, how could they know that it looked like an elephant from above, and what, that the shape of it was, was like an elephant, unless, they, unless the Egyptians somehow could fly, or they got the information from aliens they could fly. Well, it turns out it's not even named the Elephantine Island for the shape, so he didn't even bother to check that. Uh, simple fact uh, with his original book, which I think was uh, 68. Anyway, this this book called Crash Go the Chariots came out in the 70s, and when I read that, I was kind of um, disenchanted with the idea of uh, that there was substantial evidence that aliens visited us uh, in uh, ancient times. Now, they might have, but it's highly doubtful they would have done anything like use uh, humans for uh, gold mining. Um, Put aside the fact that um, it's just barely possible that maybe um, their planet was uh, deficient in gold and they might need gold, but um, gold mining is a fairly trivial thing. It's fairly um, a straightforward thing. If, 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 if there is an area that's uh, just got a small uh, percentage of gold in the rocks, well, you just need to you know, pulverize a lot of rocks, and uh, I'm sure they have something better than using mercury, mercury uh, uh, to sort it out, but um, it, you don't need, you wouldn't, wouldn't need humans or a human alien uh, species to create for that purpose. So um, there is a problem with trying to uh, come up with all these uh, crazy theories. Uh, I've watched a lot of those alien, uh, ancient alien programs on the History Channel, uh, and basically, uh, some of the ideas you think, well, maybe there might be something to that, but uh, half of them I just laugh outright at because they're just so silly. Uh, Childress uh, is one of those authors. Uh, there's another one, I don't remember his name, but he always seems to have a cockamamie idea about everything um, that has to do with some art, ancient artifact or whatnot. But there are some very mysterious things, uh, going back to ancient times, um, that uh, have not been explained, and we certainly uh, don't want to attribute everything that um, uh, the uh, uh, Sumerians or Egyptians did. Uh, we're now finding out that it's possible that uh, we may know how the pyramids were constructed, that there were internal ramps of uh, evidence that was um, uh, uh, found by a French uh, expedition that actually did gravimetric analysis of the pyramid, the, the Great Pyramid, uh, discovered anomalies meaning that there are maybe hollow areas in the pyramid that have less gravity, um, and they resemble what has been another theory that someone had, that there were internal ramps. That, so and, and vestiges of those uh, ramps may exist. Okay, so we should not ascribe automatically things that we don't understand about how the ancient uh, peoples did things. They did incredible things that in some instances, maybe we don't even know how we would do them to construct um, some of these uh, Incan, uh, pre-Incan um, uh, structures uh, in Peru and uh, Bolivia and whatnot. Um, and some uh, evidence, perhaps the Sphinx is earlier uh, due to erosion evidence. The Sphinx might have been constructed earlier. Lots of things like that. But let's not go um, off the end about ancient aliens. Okay, thank you. is sometimes laughable. Um, laughter being frequently a defense. <laughs> and I, I think it's interesting that our speaker went from concrete things such as the, the pyramids to the abstract of air, arrogance. But um, it sort of, it really expanded my mind. I've never given the subject much thought. Um, but I thought, why are we so arrogant that we think we, and we have, gone out there, Mars and the Moon, but they can't come here. I think that's very arrogant of us. Um, and we, when we've gone out there, we haven't left a lot of evidence. You know, maybe a footprint or a flag. So just because there's not a lot of evidence that they have left, and why couldn't they have come then? 
when we can go out there now and in the future. Um, that was the insight that I got from our speaker tonight, so thank you. Can I say something, sir? Are you almost done? Can I say something, sir? Let's go up there and have a seat. Have a seat, have a seat, have a seat something. Oh, certainly. Have a little right here. Run up and say something. Just don't get any ideas. This guy here, he wants to occupy the college. Occupy. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, <laughs> the thing we do want this fiber to start. Okay. Let's see. Uh, we have had reference uh, to uh, scripture. Uh, the scriptures were edited. I, I thank you. You know, in the last uh, in, in the nineteen hundreds. Thomas Van Gulliker, uh, the uh, German uh, uh, biblical scholar, uh, uh, traced uh, four uh, four different uh, sources uh, for the uh, Torah, uh, the, the books of uh, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Numbers, the first. Uh, uh, five books of uh, uh, Deuteronomy uh, of uh, the Bible. And they were only canonized, if that is the proper term, at the end of the first century of the Common Era uh, by the uh, a Synod uh, of. Ah! I've forgotten the name of the place. <laughs> so did Rick Perry. <laughs> I, don't, I don't think that he was referring to it. Uh, but yes, I am coming. Uh, but I'm not running for president. Uh, but this one, uh, Thank God. Uh, but, uh, at any rate, uh, <laughs> and of course, uh, the New Testament wasn't uh, canonized, but you know, it, 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 the uh, the books of uh, the most of uh, the what is attributed to Paul uh, was accepted uh, in many churches, but uh, in the first century, uh, so and. Uh, a good deal of the New Testament uh, was both written and, and accepted in the first century uh, by, by Christian groups, of course. Uh, when it comes to uh, a, the, the formal uh, canon of uh, Scripture uh, by... Um, uh, maybe 300 A.D. You have. Well, what I'm saying is that it's a, a tradition that has been worked on and uh, thought about and uh, by uh, communities, both uh, the Hebrew and uh, Christian, over hundreds of years, and the, by the end of the uh, fourth century, uh, this uh, uh, have been accepted, and of course, different people, as you uh, uh, have drawn different things from them, but there has been a lot of consensus. and. Uh, uh, the Vedic trend, uh, the tradition, and the Confucian trend, uh, traditions, and the Buddhist trends, uh, traditions, also have a lot of consensus. Uh, and uh, you can learn a great deal from 
any of these tra traditions. Uh, if they, or you can learn nothing. Uh, lots of people learn very little, even uh, going through school. Uh, and uh, lots of people learn the wrong things uh, from uh, their traditions. Uh, the book uh, our speaker has written uh, is, uh, I would think, rather confusing. And I'm sorry about that, but it, it can also be an enlightening. Uh, it, it, it certainly has a lot of imagination to it, and uh, the imagination uh, has also a tradition behind it of value, of human values, uh, and the uh, author has expressed that. Thank you. Second does always gear and always try to when I when it shows like the X Files and anything that it gets involved with UFOs. It certainly has scared me, scared me for a long time. So I have to face that aliens might be the worst but the British, the Americans did to the Native Americans of North America slaughter us and genocide us and the just kind of just wipe us out. I've always been afraid of it. I, mean, I see I remember reading the She Wells the War of the Worlds. This guy was fired the science fiction on there and she was what it was that scared me enough. And it turned my attention to other forms of, uh, of science fiction. I, I never liked Star Trek much or any of those shows. But unfortunately, I did see something. It was in 1995. I rarely say or talk about this to anybody. I don't know why I even think about it. 1995, it was at the corner, this corner right here, Irving Park, Damon and Lincoln. I was going to go see a girl sing some folk songs at a restaurant. Right across the street on, on Lincoln. He said, My arts are down in this class. I was just going to support him. Eight o'clock said I looked up and there was a huge metal round thing just floating there suspended with little windows, no sound, no wings, no propeller, no wind at all, just floating there. I looked up, looked down, I looked up and it was still there, I looked up and looked up down and it went away soundly, it totally disappeared and I've never seen anything like it since. I have no explanation for it, but I'm sure it was not a hallucination. I wish it was, I really wish it was. Because it was really scary. I never talked about this to anybody, but since I, it's, it's just something I was brought up, I just, I just thought I, I, I would tell you about it. I'm not a uh, kid yet or anything. I just, I just, just saw it, and that, that, that's the end of the story. You know? I, wish, I wish I could believe whether I was uh, begging the whole thing about hallucinating, but, uh, but I don't think I was. It was just there, disappeared, no sound. Two beings are all in proportion. That's it. message of, of that we should uh, be kind to each other because that certainly is uh, something that's very important. Uh, although there are some here. No personal things. At any rate. Um, and, and actually those those are, are really sort of the um, uh, ongoing theme of, of, of the all kinds of religious groups. And uh, as an atheist, um, I um, have been thinking about this and, and listening to what other people have had to say about this. And it seems that most people uh, agree that it's an outgrowth of what it takes to live in a group so that you survive as a group, that you have to be kind to each other, you shouldn't yell at each other, you shouldn't murder each other. Um, you shouldn't steal the other guy's wife because then he's not going to have your back when you're attacked as a group. So um, all of those things can grow out of that kind of social morality that's necessary for us to survive as a species. And, but nonetheless, it's, it's, it's important that we um, think about that because we're in a situation where um, we're struggling to, some of us or many of us are struggling to survive and we kind of forget that. Um, the second thing, um, again, some people have criticized using the Bible as a historical reference and I'm certainly at the head of that list. It's a great folk story. It has enormous 
numbers of inaccuracies and contradictions and that uh, the leading cause of death in the Bible is God. And <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's commanding the, Isra uh, the Isra uh, Israeli, uh, Israelites, Israelites, you know, to go cut, cut the, the fetuses out of the wombs of the pregnant women, and, uh, save the virgins, but slaughter everybody else down to the dogs and cats. Um, so. You know, uh, at, we heard Steven Pinker the other day, uh, or a few, few weeks ago, and he looked at some serious evidence, archaeological evidence, and um, and compared to the population of the world at the time, et cetera, et cetera, and the death rates from violence in the ancient world was much, much higher than it is now, even though we have Jonestown and the, uh, the uh, Holocaust, and um, all these, and the Rwanda slaughters and all that, proportional to the population, you were much likely to be murdered violently in the old world than you were in the, in the new world, or in the, in the modern world. Um, and so, um, I guess, um, again, I, 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 I also try to, um, oh, and the, and the other comment that I, that, that we live on, that uh, this, this, uh, society goes from the left side of the brain. I'm sure that, that some of the illogical things that we've heard here in the college in the past few months would would beg to differ that particular point <laughs> because we have heard some astoundingly illogical things up here. Um, okay, so um, the the dates. I mean, I'm I'm not a I'm not really a historian, but the, but the dates that that I'm aware of are very different than the dates that. Uh, Mr. Crowley um, talks about, um, I, I guess, um, in terms of being positive about all this, that I'm, I'm going to look up the, uh, the myth of Tantalus, because I, I think I read it a long time ago, but I've forgotten what it was. And, um, and also just to take away that whole thing about um, just be kind to each other, I think that's very, very important. Thanks a lot, Gene. All right, thank you very much. It was a uh, uh, good catalyst to an evening here. Oh, wrong one. All right, I'll be eclectic as usual here. Uh, first, I got to pick on that. Um, communication varies only on the information that's conveyed. The veracity you're getting in the medium is the message kind of argument that people would give more credibility to one carrier or vehicle of information over another. Um, it, it's, it's how they're conveyed. If Charles Dickens wrote about child abuse in the 19th century, however, it was only in the 20th century when they photographed it, that something was done about it. So whether or not the, the word has precedence over the printed word, over, over visual or new, new technology like media, movies, and things of that nature. Uh, no, it's just the, the, the amount of information that is conveyed and the requirement upon the recipient or the viewer. Uh, okay, I'm going to jump again here now. If you say there, well, there were ancient aliens here. Which is, well, I love this stuff. I think, I, I think this is great. Um, however, when, when the men were on the moon, they left all kinds of things on the moon. They left what in archaeology you call artifacts. <coughs> and I'm sorry, Doug, where are the artifacts? How strong is the evidence? I mean, you're using arguments. You, you look on the garden like they like the theologians use for God. And they come upon a garden and they say there must be a gardener. Does that establish the existence of a gardener? Certainly not. You have to, but in the absence of artifacts, anything in archaeology is artifact based. You know, otherwise, I don't know what you're, precisely what you're talking about. 
Um, and that's basically evidence there. Now, why man creates is a deeper question here. Why do they do these things? Heck if I know. I really don't comprehend, I, and like Margaret, I don't comprehend a lot of things I hear at the College of Complexes. <laughs> Nevertheless, we created this information and felt the need to convey it to the rest of us. But uh, that's, a, that's another issue altogether. Now, the Bible's been covered a little bit. The Bible is not a worthless as any sort of hysterical narrative. It's largely folk tales and poetry, and you have to recognize it as such. Uh, whether or not, now you had one premise there, I was looking in the book, which is a cool book. You said that this, this information was conveyed to the ancients, but in, in, a, in a solid fashion. That I believe there was trial and error in, throughout the ancient world. It, particularly as it pertains to agriculture, and particularly as it pertains to Egyptian architecture. The first pyramid was a mistake. It didn't work, and it had to be redone altogether. Now, one could say that they were not quite used to the technology, you know, they lacked experience in its application and things of that nature. But there certainly was trial and error uh, if you want an evolution uh, and an advancement in tool making and things of that nature. Uh, going back to the ancients, no, it's certainly, I must admit I am fascinated by the ancients. That's why I spent many, many years uh, studying them. I like philosophy, and if I begin any topic in philosophy, I always say go back and you can see what the Greeks had to say about it. Uh, now, last of all, uh, we're talking about the 99 percenter here, and you feel, sir, that an educated citizenry is important to our society. So do I. I've been trying to get you guys to understand some certain basic concepts for years without any success whatsoever. <laughs> so if you can get to, by the way, did you know I negotiated for the 99% with the city of Chicago? <laughs> by some quirk, I won't ever get into the story. I, I attended an event. I found myself in the mayor's office and I said, why don't we adopt the procedures you have certain things you'd like and certain things we'd like. And I said, in the organized labor movement, we arrive at a memorandum of understanding. We, we exchange proposals, and the city agreed to it. But thank you very much. All right, thanks, so Dean. That was really good. Thank you. It's a good point. A lot of little things in there. Since we're talking about mythology tonight. <laughs> I want to tell you a little bit of a folk tale about a shepherd, about a shepherd and a bunch of sheep in ancient Ethiopia. This, uh, this shepherd was a sheepherd, as you all know what shepherds are. And one day, you know, he was taking his sheep out on the range, and they were feeding. And it was getting towards the end of the day. And the shepherd came in, and he noticed all of a sudden they started eating a certain plant. And what happened with the certain plant was that these sheep started doing sheep things. They started getting more excited, more agitated, you know. The goats are button heads, the, the female sheep were starting to get more excited about certain things. And uh, it took the sheep herder quite a while to calm this herd down and to get them home. Well, the very next day, this sheep herder brought his sheep out to pasture. They went to the very same spot, and they did it again. This happened over a series of days. And all of a sudden, this sheep herder, seeing the effect of this plant on his, on his sheep, decided to try it himself. 
unless he bit into that beam, he wound up having visions and dreams and many other things. That, my friends, is a story of the origins of our cup of coffee. And when a drink like this could come up with such concepts as Lloyd's of London and the insurance industry <laughs> under, you know, a coffee house, or the rise of a modern capitalistic market from a coffee house and a little bit of a drinking of this drink. How hard could it be then for an ancient civilization to build pyramids? How hard could it be then for an ancient civilization with the usage of this drink to come up with some harebrained ideas, <laughs> let alone those that we've heard tonight? Here, here. You know, as we said, you know, Mike Judge himself is a coffee drinker who came up with that cartoon of rampant cynicism 20 years ago called Beavis and Butthead. And of course, they're now having new episodes. So all in all, maybe it's not ancient aliens that did it, but how about just a bunch of people having their good old cup of joe? Yeah. <laughs> First off, thank you to the speaker for uh, sharing your ideas with us. Uh, this is my first time here, and I don't really have anything particular in particular to say. Um, my girlfriend actually brought me here. It was on a whim, so I didn't really know what to expect, but I have to say that I'm uh, definitely pleased to be here. So thank you, everybody, for being here and welcoming me here as well. Um, I have to say that... Uh, College of Complex is a minor revelation to me because uh, I struggle on a day-to-day -day basis with the reality of living in a world that's uh, devoid of discourse. And to, to be able to find, discover a place like this where there are a lot of people exchanging ideas, uh, even if they differ in a lot of respect, uh, it's very refreshing to me and encouraging. So um, I'm just, I just wanted to thank everybody for being here and uh, let you know that I really enjoyed myself and I'll be coming back. Alright, uh, I just wanted to uh, say a little bit about what I heard. Uh, somebody asked about the possibility of there being aliens here currently. Uh, other people were talking about the, uh, the Occupy movement. And I'm pretty sure that if you uh, ask the people from the Occupy movement, they would tell you that there are aliens currently here on Earth. They're involved in, part in politics, and they're called the Tea Party. <laughs> <laughs> the tea Party, <clears throat> they probably say the same thing about the Occupy Wall Street movement. Uh, point being that a lot of it is a matter of perspective. Yeah. Yeah, just like he was talking about with, uh, with the Cup of Joe, you know. I just look at some of the things I see on the History Channel about ancient aliens and, you know, I just, I, I try to figure for myself how could some of the things that they figured out possibly have happened. And the first time that I ever heard anything about ancient aliens and ancient alien theories outside of uh, Chariot of the Gods, which I thought was kind of far out there, was uh, the whole thing with the Mayan calendar and the line of the pyramids and the I Ching and everything ending up in 2012 and I thought it was kind of, you know, interesting but kind of, you know, so what. And I remember hearing at the end something about that the Mayans believed that at 2012 that the Earth would be lined up with a great void in the center of, of the universe. And I believe it was like a couple of years ago Astronomers just discovered that there is indeed, in fact, a black hole at the center of, of the Milky Way of our galaxy. And I just, I just, you know, it's easy to to discount ancient alien theory and things like that. But again, it's a matter of personal perspective. I can't figure out how on earth, you know, a bunch of uh, uh, the, the the Mayans and uh, an agricultural uh, society could figure out that there's a black hole at the center of the universe. I mean, I don't, I don't have any clue as to how to even see a black hole. Good. I just thought I, I wanted to point that out and, and, you know, there's debunkers out there and sometimes I have more problems with uh, some of the theories that debunkers come up with. Uh, 
than the people who actually believe they saw you up those and things like that. So uh, just wanted to make sure that I, that I pointed uh, you know, out that I think it's a matter of perspective. And as far as dealing with the Bible and religion and all this stuff like that, saying that it's, um, you know, you're supposed to believe in what you believe in, and that's supposed to be a question of faith. And, you know, all of a sudden I discovered that, you know, aliens had something to do with something that happened in the Bible. You know, it still boils down to one's faith. And that, if you think about it, if we send somebody to another planet, okay, I, Barack Obama is not about to get on a rocket and shoot himself off to Jupiter, okay? It's just not going to happen. So, even if there were people that came to visit us, I, I highly doubt that it would be like the top of the food chain. <laughs> so, you know, I, again, I just wanted to say it, it all boils down to uh, perspective and, you know, question of faith and what you, what you really believe in your, in your heart. But, you know, I, I think what, what's wonderful about being human is that we ask these questions and we listen to each other's answers. So. Uh, I want to thank the speaker and you know everyone here for giving your perspective. You guys, I forgot one thing. Um, I have a bunch of cards with uh, what's called portal websites on them, and there's a website that deals with uh, what we were talking about tonight. It's called the Want to Know Info site. Um, they have 16 different disciplines, and you can print out two page. 10-page summaries with 99.9% .9 accuracy. They give you ratings, massive references, just the opposite of somebody that, uh, you know, writes a book. You know, to criticize your book because you're not familiar with the evidence, I think, is the exact opposite of what you were trying to portray tonight. I like your philosophy where you say, if somebody gives you evidence that you haven't heard about yet, Take a look, read, study it, and then you'll understand. Don't just stand up at a mic and say, well, I never heard of that, so that's a crock of horse manure. You know, that, that's, that's too common in our society, and knowledge would spread faster if people would keep an open mind and say, hey, I didn't know that was happening. That's really interesting. So anybody wants one of these cards, uh, you know, that's interested uh, in a uh, body of knowledge that's available through the Internet in books, Massive books in stores. Uh, there's just a, a wide variety of, you know, excellent knowledge. Uh, Project Disclosure is one of them, and um, you know, the, this subject is it's currently happening right now. It's not ancient history. It's happening all over the world as we're heading toward 2012. Thank you. And what's he doing? People are coming up twice, so uh, just that. Yeah. 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 The evidence for the ancient aliens is much more specious, um, nebulous, um, but uh, one of the things that was pointed out in those ancient alien programs was the uh, vitrification of uh, soil uh, in a couple of locations, uh, which might indicate uh, an explosions of sufficient magnitude uh, creating enough heat to cause that vitrification. This has also been noticed uh, when uh, um, uh, witnesses uh, see uh, UFOs landing. The vitrification of so soil is uh, physical evidence that has been uh, retrieved and analyzed by investigators. Uh, so those are two things. Uh, one thing also that uh, I wanted to really uh, praise the speaker of uh, uh, some of the praises and some of the uh, um, uh, opinions he's had uh, tonight about, um, uh, in general, things like that we should uh, revere survival of the wisest rather than survival of the fittest. Uh, that perhaps uh, uh, if we could uh, steal ourselves, that uh, we are going to hopefully emerge from this so-called Iron Age into an age of enlightenment or an age of Aquarius or whatever you want to call it. Uh, that would be a, a boon to uh, humanity. So thank you very much for those opinions, sir. Speaker gets the last word.
speaker oh, gets the last word. Oh, I find you. some burn holes in my yard. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I'd like to thank everybody for like their participation. One fool at a time. I hope you enjoyed yourselves. I enjoyed myself, even though I'm somewhat rusty uh, in front of a group. I used to do this or lecture for 32 years, and I had 10 years off. But I do enjoy talking. I like the young man who said that this is a place where you can get a chance to talk. Outside of this place, very few people do communicate with one another. They're so busy, uh, perhaps, telling people they're wrong or they do not communicate. And this is what I've been telling a lot of people that we have a problem with communications because we do not actually understand what another person is saying. Instead of saying, would you clear that, clarify that for me, it's something like, like, I don't believe that and something that's quite negative. I do wish our world would communicate more. I wish there would be more love, more peace. I hope that the age of Aquarius will come where we where we will all be happy and joyful and can help each and every one of us here. I do have books for sale. They're only $22. I think the price is it's okay because it's something that you can read and reread and perhaps be influenced by the box, the uh, bibliography to read other books that I did use. But I do want to thank you again for your support. I'm happy that some of you made very positive comments. The negative comments, that's okay. I mean, that's fine. <laughs> I do thank everybody for being such a wonderful audience. Thank All you very right. much. Yeah. <laughs> 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 <laughs>